Judah has poured his heart out to Joseph, who is second only to Pharaoh. So what will his final judgment be on his brothers? Greetings, friends, and welcome. But to back up a bit, in our last episode, we saw the sons of Israel return to Egypt to procure more food for their families. And Joseph, his identity still hidden from his brothers, welcomes them with hospitality, but then, as they're leaving, accuses them of stealing from his house. What did they steal? You can check out this last episode to find out. And at the end of that, Judah gives a very emotional speech on behalf of his brothers, especially Benjamin. So now Joseph is in a position to place his final verdict on his brothers. So what will he do? We ask the Holy Spirit to guide our reading of the scripture as we continue. Joseph could no longer control himself in the presence of all his attendants. So he cried out, have everyone withdraw from me. Thus, no one else was about when he made himself known to his brothers. But his sobs were so loud that the Egyptians heard him, and so the news reached Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still in good health? But his brothers could give him no answer, so dumbfounded were they at him. Come closer to me, he told his brothers. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you once sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed, and do not reproach yourselves for having sold me here. It was really for the sake of saving lives that God has sent me here ahead of you. For two years now, the famine has been in the land, and for five more years, tillage will yield no harvest. God, therefore, sent me on ahead of you to ensure for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives in an extraordinary deliverance. It seems that Joseph was indeed moved by Judah's testimony, so much so that he sends away his attendants so they don't see him break down in emotion in front of his brothers. I mean, he has a reputation to uphold, yet they do hear him and news gets all the way to Pharaoh. But for Joseph, that doesn't even matter at this point. He knows now that his brothers can be trusted and that soon they will all be joining him in Egypt. Yet when he reveals himself, his brothers look at him dumbfounded, still in utter disbelief. It says that he made himself known or revealed himself to his brothers. Some have suggested that he showed a birthmark or scar, but more likely it was in his questions and recounting of the past that did it. He once again asks about their father, but then recalls that they sold him into slavery. However, this is not said as a jab or to accuse them, because Joseph follows this up by saying that he is not angry with them, but rather that it was God's plan for something greater. And twice he tells them that the purpose is for him to save lives. And so we, before we get more into the theological meaning of this, let's continue and see what else happens during this reunion. So it was not really you, but God who had me come here. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his household and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. Hurry back then to my father and tell him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come to me without delay. You will settle in the region of Goshen, where you will be near me, you and your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and everything that you own. Since five years of famine still lie ahead, I will provide for you there so that you and your family and all that are yours may not suffer want. Surely you can see for yourselves, and Benjamin can see for himself, that it is I, Joseph, who am speaking to you. Tell my father all about my high position in Egypt and what you have seen, but hurry and bring my father down here. Therefore he flung himself on the neck of his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept in his arms. Joseph then kissed all his brothers, crying over each of them, and only then were his brothers able to talk with him. So the brothers are still probably standing there confused as to what's going on, but Joseph just keeps talking. And this shows his own development and how his relationship with his brothers has really changed. I mean, he is the youngest, younger than all of them except for Benjamin, yet he speaks to them as if he knows the will of God. And he goes and he continues by just saying, this is what you're going to do, and then you're going to do that, in the same way that he had really planned everything for Pharaoh and his household. Remember how he had told Pharaoh how to handle the years of abundance and famine, he made plans for the cattle and farms throughout Egypt. Now he tells his brothers that they will bring back their father and their families. In fact, all their animals and possessions as well. He will set aside a region in Egypt for them and make sure that they are safe and fed. And then when it seems like he has almost finished talking, Any questions? he realizes that they're still staring at him in disbelief. And so he catches himself and once again acts as their brother instead of their superior. He embraces Benjamin and just weeps with them. Then he embraces all of his brothers. And you can imagine then finally it clicks. 
they are back together as one family. And so in this moment of fraternal love and vulnerability, his brothers, we are told, are finally able to speak with him freely. But let's get back to what Joseph offered his family. While Joseph was in charge of the land of Egypt, was it in his place to invite his entire family to migrate and give them a large chunk of land? So let's see what Pharaoh has to say about this. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and his courtiers were pleased. So Pharaoh told Joseph, Say to your brothers, This is what you shall do. Load up your animals and go without delay to the land of Canaan. There, get your father and your families, and then come back here to me. I will assign you the best land in Egypt, where you will live off the fat of the land. Instruct them further. Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your children and your wives, and to transport your father on your way back here. Do not be concerned about your belongings, for the best in the whole land of Egypt shall be yours. The sons of Israel acted accordingly. Joseph gave them the wagons, as Pharaoh had ordered, and he supplied them with provisions for the journey. He also gave to each of them fresh clothing, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred shekels of silver and five sets of garments. Moreover, what he sent to his father was ten jackasses loaded with the finest products of Egypt, and ten jennies loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. As he sent his brothers on their way, he told them, Let there be no recriminations on the way. As we have seen throughout this narrative, Pharaoh acts as an ally to Joseph, and he continues to do so at this point. In fact, Joseph must have made a pretty good impression on all of Pharaoh's court, because all of the officials seem pleased with this news. And so Pharaoh invites all of Joseph's family to come and settle in Egypt. Now, many scholars attribute these verses to a different author than the previous, when it was Joseph who made plans for his family's migration and settlement. And this can very well be the case. However, we can also see this as an assertion of power on Pharaoh's part. Joseph may have overstepped his station when he told them that they can come before consulting anyone. Pharaoh, however, overlooks this and makes the proclamation that the family of Joseph will be welcome to settle in the land and that the people of Egypt, in essence, will provide the wagons and moving expenses. Pharaoh's action is like that of many in executive leadership that takes the idea of his subordinates and makes it his own. There's a few details in the story that further reveal the relationship that Joseph has with his brothers. I think that's one of the reasons why I love this story so much. It shows the, the earthiness and the humanity of this family. First of all, when he's giving provisions for them, he gives Benjamin extra money and five times the amount of clothing that he gives his other brothers. And this, of course, shows his favoritism towards his younger brother. And even though Joseph is the hero of the story, it shows that he does pick up a few traits from his dad. Also, the last line is great. A more direct translation would be, see that you don't fall out by the way. Some scholars have understood this as relating to their possible distrust of Joseph or accusing each other of what they had done to Joseph. But the phrase seems best understood as, don't quarrel or argue with each other along the way. It may be as simple as telling them to try and get along. You mean, you'll put down your rock and I'll put down my sword and we'll try and kill each other like civilized people? Or maybe just try not to kill each other? I mean, does he know them or what? And so their journey must have been uneventful because we don't really hear anything about it. And so they get home and let's see how Jacob takes the news. So they left Egypt and made their way to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. When they told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, it is he who is ruler of all the land of Egypt. He was dumbfounded. He could not believe them. But when they recounted to him all that Joseph had told them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent for his transport, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. It is enough, said Israel. My son Joseph is still alive. I must go and see him before I die. At first, Jacob is just like his sons. He's dumbfounded and he doesn't believe them. In fact, he'd been mourning for so long that he has just given up hope. And we can imagine his sons trying to convince him. They go and show him the wagons and all of the gifts. I mean, surely if they stole the goods, they wouldn't want to be returning to Egypt so soon. And so finally, Israel gives in and he realizes my son is alive. Now this theme of a father rejoicing over a son he thought dead is a theme that we will see continue throughout the scripture. We will see it in the stories of the prophets and even in the parables of Jesus. And so let us continue as we see this migration of Israel and his family to Egypt. Israel set out with all that was his. When he arrived at Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. There God, speaking to Israel in a vision by night, called, Jacob, Jacob. Here I am, he answered. Then he said, I am God, 
the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. Not only will I go down to Egypt with you, I will also bring you back here after Joseph has closed your eyes. So Jacob departed from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel put their father and their wives and children on the wagons that Pharaoh had sent for his transport. They took with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in the land of Canaan. Thus Jacob and all his descendants migrated to Egypt. His sons and his grandsons, his daughters and his granddaughters, all his descendants he took with him to Egypt. So in all of this excitement to go see his long-lost son, Joseph, it seems that Jacob forgot to consult with God. And if Jacob has learned anything in his life, it is that he needs to ask God before making any major decisions. And so finally, when they get to Beersheba, he does just that. And this is the place where, of course, Abraham and Isaac had both built altars to God. And so Jacob does the same and offers his prayer. And as he has done before, God appears to Jacob in a dream. The text doesn't actually tell us the nature of Jacob's prayer, but various reasons have been suggested, such as thanksgiving for the news of Joseph, prayers for the protection of his family, or confirming the covenant that was made with Abraham. Jacob may have even been aware of the prophecy given to Abraham when God told him that his descendants would be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years, and this could have given him hesitation. A common interpretation also agrees with my thoughts on his desire to affirm that this journey was indeed God's will. And the response from God does indeed seem to answer such a prayer, for he tells Israel not to be afraid to go down to Egypt. He also confirms the covenant, but tells him that he would not return until after he has died. This could have a couple of meanings. He could be speaking to him as Jacob, saying that his body would be returned to Canaan. God could also be referring to him as Israel, meaning that his people will return after he and the current generation have passed away. Of course, both will come to be true, in addition to what the Lord had told Abraham. And so he continues down to Egypt with his family and all of his possessions. And since they will be traveling to a new land, we will be told of who all of these descendants are. And so we will have another genealogy to close up this section, which will also be found in some of the genealogies of the clan lists in the book of Numbers. These are the names of the Israelites, Jacob and his descendants who migrated to Egypt. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon, Nemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Jashub, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jaliel. These were the sons whom Leah bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, along with his daughter Dinah, 33 persons in all, male and female. The sons of Gad, Zephon, Hagi, Shuni, Esbon, Eri, Arad, and Arali. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, and Beriah, with their sister Sarah. And the sons of Beriah, Heber, and Malkiel. These were the descendants of Zilpah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah. These she bore to Jacob, sixteen persons in all. The sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. In the land of Egypt, Joseph became the father of Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Esenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of Heliopolis, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Beshar, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ahiram, Shufan, Hufan, and Ard. These were the sons whom Rachel bore to Jacob, fourteen persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Guni, Jezar, and Shelem. These were the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel. These she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. Jacob's people who migrated to Egypt, his direct descendants, not counting the wives of Jacob's sons, numbered sixty-six persons in all. Together with Joseph's sons, who were born to him in Egypt, two persons, all the people comprising Jacob's family who had come to Egypt amounted to 70 persons in all. As with many genealogies, this list serves as a record that goes beyond the story itself and allows the reader to trace back all of the clans and nations of the people. 
This is the first list of all the descendants of Israel and will be expanded upon as we move forward. And there are a few things to notice about this list. For example, everyone in this list may not have been born yet when they migrated to Egypt. For example, it shows that Benjamin has already had nine sons, which would be unlikely considering his age at this point. And yet the whole family is seen as one unit, and so we have a full list for this genealogy. In a similar way, we see the use of the symbolic number 70, which is close to the number of migrants listed, but not exact, especially depending on who you include in the list. There are many that would have come to Egypt that are not listed, such as the wives of the sons of Israel. You might also notice that only a few daughters are mentioned, and there would most likely have been a greater number, especially since we were told earlier that all of Jacob's daughters and granddaughters were included. Girls were not typically listed unless they had a significant role elsewhere in the history. And there is no mention of all the servants who would have been part of the household of Israel. It is highly doubtful that they would have been left behind. And so 70 is a number that is used to express completeness. It means the totality of the people of Israel. And so we come to the reunion between Jacob and his son Joseph. Israel had sent Judah ahead to Joseph so that he might meet him in Goshen. On his arrival in the region of Goshen, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and rode to meet his father Israel in Goshen. As soon as he saw him, he flung himself on his neck and wept a long time in his arms. And Israel said to Joseph, At last I can die, now that I have seen for myself that Joseph is still alive. And here we have the practical note that Judah goes on ahead of his brothers to meet up with Joseph and prepare for their arrival in Goshen. And for a group this big to have traveled this journey, it probably would have taken them around two months. And here again, we have the confirmation that Judah really takes his role as leader amongst his brothers. And when they are close, Joseph takes a sweet ride in his chariot and goes out to greet his dad. It is, of course, an emotional reunion, and his father exclaims that his life is now complete. Knowing that his son is alive, Jacob once again has all 12 of his sons at his side. And while there are still a few more verses in this chapter, remember that chapters and verses didn't exist in the original books or scrolls. And so we'll leave them for next time as we continue the story. But for now, I'd like to look at some of the theological themes that we've seen up to this point. The theme of God's plan echoes throughout the story, and Joseph makes it very clear when he sees his brothers. He tells them that it was God who allowed him to be sold to the Egyptians so that everything would be fulfilled. Going further back, God allowed him to have and interpret dreams. The Lord also confirmed that it was his will that Jacob and his family travel to Egypt, although we know that things will eventually get very bad for the Israelites while they are there. And this brings to mind a popular phrase which I often hear, everything happens for a reason. And I'm probably going to get a lot of objections to this, but I've never liked this saying. In fact, I think it can be rather harmful. What do I mean? You might say if you go back far enough or if you go far enough into the future, you can say that it was all part of God's plan. Everything worked as it was supposed to be. Yet, I don't see God as a micromanager. And I don't think we can just shove every experience into, well, this was part of God's plan. There was a good reason for this to happen. I mean, does God use our mistakes, bad decisions, and poor judgment to carry out his plan, to teach us lessons, and to change our perspective? No doubt. But it also seems that God created a world that pretty much runs on its own based on natural laws that are part of the created order. People are the same, but with free will, and that can be unpredictable and either brings or destroys life. Both of these elements, the natural order of creation and free will, will often cause a lot of bad things to happen, bad things that God is not directly responsible for. And yet, ultimately, this is the greatest critique or objection to belief in God, one that is often called the problem of evil. This is the idea that it is God who causes hurricanes and earthquakes, cancer, and the death of children. But that's not the God I believe in. If I believe that God was actively causing these things, I wouldn't believe in him either. The God I believe in is the one who brings order from chaos, which is a central theme in all that we've been reading throughout the book of Genesis. A person of faith, Joseph, is able to look at things in hindsight to see God's guidance and how one responds to such bad things. But to be honest, I think that a lot happens and doesn't happen for no good reason at all. Through discernment, we can learn to live through such things and allow God to bring something good out of it. But that's usually easier said than done. But I'd rather not leave on such a discouraging note. So let's once again look at Joseph as a foreshadowing or prefiguration of Christ. When Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, I can't help but think of when Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after the resurrection. 
At first, they were frightened and did not believe. They thought he was dead after all. In Luke's gospel, some of them did not even recognize him. The message of the resurrection was that all of this happened so that they could have life. Joseph tells his brothers that all of this happened so that he could save lives. He even says that their actions were forgiven because it was God's will. Even when Jesus' followers abandoned him, they too were welcomed back by Jesus who embraced them and dined with them. Ultimately, the story of Joseph is one of forgiveness, particularly the forgiveness of Judah, whose story we heard right after Joseph was sold. As we will see, Judah comes to represent the people of Israel. Thank you once again for joining me, and hopefully you learned something as well. Next time, we will see how the Israelites are welcomed into Egypt and how they gain an audience with Pharaoh. Until then, forgive one another and do good.